Um, and Rob's going to talk to us about harmonizing environmental performance calculations for battery metals. Rob, take it away. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to talk um, at this conference. It's a, a really important event and it's amazing to see how many great speakers you've got. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk today uh, about harmonizing the environmental performance calculations for, for battery metals. Um, and it comes at quite a, so I'll just give you a, a quick introduction to Minviro. So as mentioned, um, we born in Cornwall, so I completed my PhD down at, at Campbell School of Mines um, and then uh, formed a spin out. Um, so still connected with Cornwall and a lot of the uh, activity going on down there. But basically we, we quantify and help uh, reduce environmental impacts uh, for mining projects and, and mostly in the battery and technology metal, metal space. So we provide both consultancy and software solutions, um, really just trying to, to improve the, the environmental performance of, of operations uh, right through the life cycle of projects. So um, I'm gonna, I, I'm not sure um, how many people have come across the, the recently published World Bank um, report highlighting the demand increase for for metals going forward to 2050 for the uh, transition to the low carbon economy. Um, but I'd like to highlight the responsibility that we have as geoscientists in this space. So traditionally the embodied impacts of say a conventional combustion vehicle have been pretty consistent through the life of the vehicle. Um, and that's obviously emissions out of the tailpipe. But as we transition to electric vehicles, and this is true as well for you know, renewable energy technologies, solar panels, wind, wind turbines, a lot of the impacts are actually during the extraction phase. And so we've got to make sure that we are extracting these materials in the most responsible way possible to ensure that we're not offsetting in the benefits of the technology that's occurring downstream. So that's what this, this, this graphic is highlighting here. The objective is that over the life of the, the technology, we want to make that box as small as possible. We want to make that footprint as small as possible, whether it's carbon footprint or whether it's other impact categories, biodiversity loss. Um, and that was really interesting to see the talk earlier about the 80% the being, uh, or 80 or 90% of the impacts being associated with raw material extraction, which is very broadly set. Um, yeah, so this again is referring to the World Bank's Climate Smart mining uh, recent publication which highlights the materials that are going to be in great demand going forward to 2050 uh, and interestingly graphite has has come right to the top in terms of demand increase owing primarily because of battery use in battery storage um, and what is interesting about this is we really don't have very good data about the environmental impact of different graphite production routes so we, don't, we've, we might have a few academic studies which might look at very specific projects for say natural graphite production, but we really don't have good, robust and transparent data on the production of say synthetic graphite. And this is, and this is again highlighting from those that limited data, the, the calculations that they did in, for the World Bank about what the impacts, the CO2 impacts would be from this increased demand in these materials. And as you'd expect aluminium it's going to be important in the future and aluminium production is energy intensive but I would say that aluminium is probably one of the commodities that's the most uh, advanced in terms of understanding their embodied impacts and using a life cycle perspective doing this. As I said graphite is not very well established and lithium again they might have a few data points which are outdated and not uh, suitable for today's technology. So I won't talk about life cycle assessment too much, but this is the basic approach that we use. Um, happy to talk about it for as long as anybody wants. I did my whole PhD on that, so happy to talk about LCA methodology and everything if anybody's interested in that. But I just wanted to highlight as well that these, these static values that are being used for these calculations by the World Bank and other institutions, they don't necessarily reflect the reality of future resources. This is an example from a publication by uh, Rembrandt Cupola in 2016, just looking at how the change in grade for copper projects influences the energy requirements. And so therefore will really impact the, the, the CO2 intensity if you're assuming the same grid mix. 
Um, and you also have evolving technologies and evolving resource types. You know, we, an example is in the nickel space. We might be moving away to more towards laterite uh, type deposits in the future. I also just wanted to highlight that, you know, we're not just talking about climate change. That's, that's a, a common impact category that's, that's picked up uh, by, by everyone and, and rightly so, it's very important. But it's important to note that uh, there are a number of other impact categories that we need to make sure that we're not impacting as well, like biodiversity loss, um, and a particularly impact one, uh, impact one going into this uh, 2020s, 2030s is going to be water availability. Um, I won't talk about too, too much about product oriented studies today, but I just wanted to highlight this is this is again highlighting um, th this reflects really well to the previous talks where policy has policy isn't necessarily uh, directed at the raw materials side. These are three examples of life cycle assessment studies which have looked at the environmental impact of battery manufacturing and use in vehicles. And the limitation for these studies isn't in the methodology that they're using, but it's in the quality of the raw material data that's going into the model. So, and this is, uh, uh, this is to highlight the point here. So Enviro recently completed a life cycle assessment study um, for lithium hydroxide production looking at different uh, sources. So we looked at the South American brine uh, and also looked at hard rock spodumene coming from Australia and then being processed in China. And those results there on the right indicate that you've got from South America brine, you might have an impact of five kilograms of CO2 per kilogram produced. Whereas from Australia spodumene, you might have an impact going up to 15 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram produced. Now, those studies that I showed in the previous page, they're using a single number from a database which looked at a, a study from 2008, doesn't have the relevant technology today. Now, is it fair to use that one value for future LCA studies when we're looking at battery manufacturing? So that my argument is that we need a greater level of granularity and detail for these different raw material production routes so that we can make better calculations for improvements in efficiency and when we change technology and we, 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 we create you know, new battery technologies. And this is all also true for a graphite. Graphite is even more opaque than lithium and even less uh, data available. So um, if anybody's interested, um, there's, we, we posted this recently on LinkedIn, which highlights the problem uh, and highlights what we're trying to do, um, which I'll go on to now. So the, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of insinuation um, and, and discussions about integrating policies which are trying to formalise uh, the embodied impacts of a lot of these technologies that are being developed, whether it's electric vehicles or renewable energies. But the reality is our current understanding of the impacts of different raw material production routes is not sufficient to be able to do these, to, to, in, to actually adopt these policies. Um, and one of the main challenges is that we don't have frameworks for how we can consistently carry out these life cycle assessments for particular commodities. Um, and, and these frameworks basically, it's almost like a recipe book. So when you're carrying out life cycle assessment, you have to make sure that you're being consistent from one project to another project. Mm -hmm. You know, you're making the same assumptions, you're using the same uh, data sources and system boundaries, and that ensures a fair comparison. So this is our, this is what Minviro is really focusing on at the moment. Um, this is an example in the lithium space. So, so we're working together with a number of uh, stakeholders in the, in the lithium supply chain and other commodities supply chain. Um, so, you know, talking right from the miners, right through to the processing companies and right through to the anode, maybe, maybe the battery manufacturers and right through to the, the car manufacturers as well. Um, and once we've done this, we're able to have a framework which where we can correctly carry out these life cycle assessments and have robust data which we can put into these bigger life cycle assessment modules for battery manufacturing. Um, and we're doing this for, for other technology metals like lithium, graphite, rare earths and cobalt initially. Um, and I think this is an important step if we're going to improve the, the accuracy of, uh, of the environmental profile of these different product uh, creations. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much, Rob.
as always. The rounds of applause are raining around the world. So brilliant. Thank you so much to you for that presentation. Um, the, the questions are coming in thick and fast on the different channels, actually. So we've got some really good discussion going on on YouTube at the moment. Um, but one question from me, so, so everything that you've, you've got here is absolutely fantastic, especially when you're trying to understand that, you know, the full life cycle assessment, etc. cetera. Um, is, there, is there a potential threat of having a little bit of um, paralysis by analysis? rather than people just getting on with making decisions? Um, or where do you see that tipping point is? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And, and this is from conversations with mining companies. They, they don't want any additional uh, requirements to do analysis and, and calculations, especially in the sustainability space where this is evolving very quickly. I think what we need, to, it's, it's worth putting the effort into doing an assessment consistently and correctly rather than doing ones that aren't consistent across projects at the end of the day that's that's not useful to do one company to do one style of assessment and another company to do another style of assessment mm -hmm. using different assumptions because then you haven't got any clarity of, of what is a better approach and what is not a better approach and then that information can't be used downstream because it you know it's not consistent so uh, i think there needs to i think the the eu was has been trialing these um frameworks but again, this is going back to the point where raw materials isn't at the forefront of, of the important things. They're prioritizing other frameworks in other sectors. So, um, so we're trying to bring together stakeholders in the industry and get consensus there. And then hopefully we'll have a, a skeleton for, the, for the, the bigger organizations to adopt in the future. Great, thanks for that, Rob. Um, and so is that something there where, I mean, as, as you mentioned, and also Joel was alluding to this as well, um, there are a number of um, perhaps policies, frameworks, funding initiatives that are talking about responsibility, but they forget about where the raw material comes from as a whole. Is that something here where you're very much involved in making sure that there is the input into that more circular economy? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think, um, the, the priority, uh, an example is, say, equipment manufacturers. They've always had a priority of, of you know, just, just getting the material that they need for, for manufacturing. But it's, it's now there's more and more pressure all the time for them to actually understand the embodied impacts of their supply chain. And uh, they're, they're stumbling as much as anyone else to understand the impacts of the, raw, of, of the mine and then the rest of the supply chain. So... I think there's going to be a lot of stakeholders that are going to have to work together to try and uncover this and uh, create a consistent methodology. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Rob. Now, um, we've got a couple of um, fantastic questions that are coming in for you. Um, and so the first one comes from Fernando. And Fernando is asking, have you looked into the impact of neodymium magnets? Yes. Um, I actually, that was my, my PhD research was on, uh, on rare earth, rare earth, so that's quite well suited. Um, but I only I only went up to the the rare earth oxide formation. So uh, uh, it is very interesting the the area of rare earth production, and there are certain impact categories that uh, will probably grab the attention more than others. And an example is radioactivity issues associated with certain deposit types. Um, but but yeah, I mean happy happy for was it Fernando to send me send me. Um, an email and I, I can send him some of the resources that uh, I did on rare earth production. Brilliant and we're assuming that that wasn't a planted question that came. <laughs> <laughs> no it was a nice question yeah. Um, and actually with regards to um, what you're alluding to there in terms of um, perhaps radioactivity in certain deposit types and uh, we've had a number of talks earlier on this week uh, for example Catherine Goodenough's talk yesterday and um, that spoke about some of those aspects which is great. Um, another question here that comes in um, from Sandra and Sandra um, asks uh, many people are talking about hydrogen as an energy resource which is still much to be improved um, but should raw materials um, as a sector provide a boost in the technology and in the respective life cycle studies mainly regarding the metals for the technology and is with this in within the gambit of geoscience yeah I mean the the whole principle of life cycle assessment is so you can compare these these types of, of technologies it seems that the you know hydrogen seems to have been put to the side over the last 
five years or so, but it seems to have had a resurgence, especially, I mean, I'm hearing a lot of news come out about funds going into further developments and, and development. But um, this is what life cycle assessment is for, to be able to compare systems that seem very complex and different but you can you know, take into account the raw materials and, and the full life cycle costs, in, including the end of life, and, and compare, say, wind energy with energy storage versus, versus hydrogen. Great, thank you for that. Um, and final question, and um, back to Fernando again, so I assume that this is another planted question that we <laughs> have here. Um, and Fernando asks, um, what is your opinion with regards to the new report of the transport and environment saying that the, electrical vehicle, the electric vehicles are three times less polluting than ICEs? So this was, uh, this is really interesting. And I, I saw the, I, I recommend to everyone to go onto this, that, that platform and play around with it all because it is very interesting. You can you can s s simulate your, your car being in different parts of the world and, and seeing how the different grid mix impacts the overall CO2 intensity. But again, this study, the limitation to that study is the same. It's the, the raw material data going into the model. That is, that, that, that is the limitation. And um, it's not the, the quality of the data isn't consistent for each commodity. So as I said, there's, there's very few data points on the different graphite production routes. Um, whereas aluminium, there's a there's a really good industry association who who really spends a lot of money and resources on on understanding it. Fantastic! Thank you very much for that, Rob. And um, you will see within the Q and A's that um, there is lots of room for you to type additional answers in there as well. So please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for another round of applause or virtual round of applause for the fantastic Rob Pearl. Brilliant! Thanks very much, Rob.